Captain Jack Swallows. <laughs> it's kind of gay, dude. Pirates of the Caribbean is a franchise that I'm surprised got as popular as it did. Really looking back on it, I don't think anyone could have predicted just how big of a hit the first film was. It's a movie based off a theme park attraction in Disneyland, and the writers, director, and producers somehow convinced Disney to drop $140 million to turn this into a movie. A movie that was essentially made just to promote the ride, but somehow got turned into a summer blockbuster, and obviously a very successful one, which led to four sequels that were all financially successful. Hell, two of them even broke a billion dollars, with another not far behind. But there was a noticeable drop in quality as the films progressed. You can see this in the review scores from both the audiences and critics. The latest film, Dead Men Tell No Tales, was released back in 2017 and was so poorly received that it buried the franchise, and the plans for the all-female reboot slash sequel was cancelled, which honestly was probably for the best, would have just been dancing on the grave at that point. But I think it's safe to say that the series is officially dead. Some may be sad about that, but considering the drop in quality, I would say that was probably for the best. They were some pretty fun movies, and it's still really impressive that this one movie turned into a giant smash hit and spawned a whole franchise, and so I think it's time to take a look back at these movies and get my thoughts on each one, talk about what worked, what didn't, and then towards the end, see if we can figure out what and where it all went wrong. Of course, there will be some spoilers, so heads up. You ready? Let's get into it. Captain Jack, what? Johnny Depp. No. Now, I've already mentioned this in the beginning, but I want to talk about it a bit more here. The first film was put into production because Disney had a ride of the same name, and they were no strangers to making movies based on their attractions. There were several released before and around this time. It's a pretty interesting form of promotion, really. They already have the attraction, so make a movie that kids would enjoy, and give them another reason to nag their parents to go to Disneyland. The ride was originally made in the 70s, with ideas for a movie being brought up in the 90s, apparently with Steven Spielberg at the helm, though this never materialized. But then the idea popped up again in the early 2000s, and after going through different variations of the script, production finally began. The mad lads behind this movie were able to convince Disney to drop $140 million to fund the project, and to invest in some new technology that would help bring the film to life. Well actually, Disney weren't the only ones who worked on this movie. A little known producer named Jerry Bruckheimer was very much involved as well. If the name sounds familiar, it's because him and his studio have funded and produced several movies and shows going all the way back to the 80s and 90s. Oh, well, you know, stuff like Top Gun, The Rock, Con Air, Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, National Treasure, the list really just kind of goes on. He's produced a lot of movies with a lot of different studios from Paramount to Sony to Fox, and of course, Disney. So having him in your corner is a good way to ensure you get some pretty decent backing. But he took a big interest in the movie, and so he used his pull and past history of Disney to help strike up a deal and get production rolling. They pitched it as a summer blockbuster, which Disney didn't have many of at the time. Remember, this was the early 2000s. This was before the MCU, and before they owned Star Wars. And successful blockbusters can have a very high return, but of course it's a very high risk considering their cost. But Disney was willing to gamble it, with the backup plan being they would ship it straight to home video if they didn't like the final product. But of course, as we all know, the film was released in theaters in 2003 and shattered expectations, bringing in over $650 million, becoming a certified hit, much bigger than anyone could have anticipated. Now with a little history lesson out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the movie itself now. So, Curse of the Black Pearl follows the story of Elizabeth Swan, a governor's daughter, who gets kidnapped by a pirate crew who are looking to break a curse that was set upon them. But a young man named Will Turner teams up with a pirate named Jack Sparrow, and they set sail to rescue her. And thus, a series of fun misadventures happen as they try to get her back. Now, while watching this, I was hit with a tidal wave of nostalgia. You see, this was one of those movies I used to put on late at night as I slept, just having it in the background as like ambient noise. Recently, I've been doing the same thing with Chainsaw Man, and yes, I'm gonna reference it as much as possible because I'm fucking addicted to it. So watching this was really just a good old time for me. I never really looked at this movie critically at all, and never really had an issue with it. But for this viewing, I decided I should give it a shot, and I kinda failed. I really don't have anything to complain about. This movie is just so damn fun. It's one of those films that you just throw on to have a good time and it never fails to entertain. So really, I'm just gonna list off the things that are great about it, and how several aspects held up pretty well. I just realized it's almost 20 years old now. Damn. Okay, so for starters, the cast is great. Obviously, Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow just steals the show. He's a bit goofy, kinda strange, and a little weird, but he's also very clever and really good at scheming and planning. He's a sly fox and I just love watching him. He steals every scene he's in. Without a doubt, he's my favorite character. Everyone else does a good job as well. Orlando Bloom and Keira Knightley are more so the straight men in the movie, while everyone around them is just kind of the oddballs. Barbosa is a very entertaining villain, and hell, even some of the side characters are good. These two goofy-ass pirates, these two soldiers from the Royal Navy, Mr. Gibbs, just so many fun characters. Everyone plays their part well, and I have no complaints. Seriously, there's not a single one that I didn't like. This could also be credited to the writing, because it's pretty good. Lots of memorable lines that are funny and pretty witty 
movie at times. The exchanges and banter between characters just kept cracking me up. Seriously, it's some pretty good dialogue. And as for the pacing, it's damn near perfect. It's one of those movies that doesn't feel over two hours long, even though it is. And that's due in large part to something always happening. The characters are always working towards the next step, or their next goal. So the story actually keeps progressing. You mix in the funny characters and writing, then you have yourself a movie that doesn't lose steam and is a joy to watch. And now the visuals are the things I think held up pretty damn well. It's still a pretty good looking movie. The practical effects are of course great. I mean they filmed a lot of it on a real ship, so that explains why it looks so good. And of course these big shots of the ships and sea are just great. But even most of the CGI is pretty solid. This is where most of the budget actually went. They invested in some pretty cutting edge motion capture technology to achieve these computer generated characters. And for a nearly 20 year old movie, it's not bad at all. And the stunt work is pretty creative as well. It's cool how they use the environments in their set pieces. Now it's pretty tame here compared to future films where they would get way more elaborate, but it's still pretty fun seeing people fight and actually go around the set, climbing and using items to get an advantage. And to top it all off, the music is epic. It really does give you a sense of fun and adventure. It makes you want to fire up Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Okay, so I thought about it, and if I'm going to complain about something, it would probably be the fact that there are several plot conveniences that just happen to work out for the characters. I could list them off, but I really don't care to be honest, and I actually kind of forgot them because I was having just so much fun watching the movie. But I know there's some there, I just don't care enough to go double check. But really besides that, I have no complaints. It's just a fun, entertaining movie. And the CGI held up better than I thought it was going to. And the practical effects and locations just look great. Along with the sets, the costumes, the stunt work. It's all just very well put together. I can see why Disney wanted to make a sequel. Not only because of a financial incentive, but also there's just a lot to be explored and expanded upon. There are several legends, stories, and myths about the ocean and pirates that they didn't even touch here. And considering this film wasn't afraid to lean into the fantasy and supernatural side of things, a sequel wasn't a bad idea at all. It would be a chance to build upon the world that was introduced here. And so, two sequels were greenlit to turn this into a trilogy. While this film works on its own as like a standalone story, the two sequels however were filmed back to back and were basically tied together to tell one bigger story. And the first of these two was released in 2006, titled Dead Man's Chest. Dead Man's Chest takes place not long after the first film, and we once again follow Will, Elizabeth, and Jack Sparrow. Only this time, they're in search of a chest that contains the heart of Davy Jones, but they aren't the only ones after it, with each party wanting it for different reasons. And so, the race begins to capture the heart of Davy Jones. That almost sounds like a romance. Now this movie was a decent continuation. It does a lot of things right, and is much more ambitious. The story is bigger and has a lot more moving parts. Characters have different motivations and goals from each other. They visit many more locations. The stunts and set pieces are bigger. They lean more into the fantasy elements. And they really try to expand the world. And it has a lot of things from the first film that people enjoyed. The funny banter between characters, the creative action set pieces, the sense of fun and going on a grand adventure in the world of pirates and sailing the high seas. And this time around, the fantasy elements are cranked up with Davy Jones and his ship, the Flying Dutchman. And of course, there's the Kraken. It leans into this stuff more than the first, and it does set up a bigger, more epic story. And not to mention, this movie looks great. The first one aged well for a 2003 movie, but this one looks head and shoulders better. And even to this day, it holds up very well. The CGI on Davy Jones and his crew are just top tier. Even in the daylight they look great. So even by today's standards, the CGI and special effects are still great. And Davy Jones himself is a very interesting villain. He not only has a cool design, but a very interesting backstory that's almost tragic in a way. And I definitely want to learn more about him because I found him and the way he operated to be very intriguing. And of course, Orlando Bloom, Keira Knightley, and Johnny Depp were all great in their respective roles. So in a lot of aspects, it's a good movie. There's a lot of the same stuff that worked from the first, and they expand upon the world in an interesting way. Although there's just a few things I have issue with. One pretty minor than one I'm pretty major. The minor issue is that the pacing is a bit weak, and some parts just do feel like a drag. It's a nearly two and a half hour long movie, so that does play a factor, but films like Infinity War and The Dark Knight are the same length and have excellent pacing. And I mean hell, this is only 10 minutes longer than the first. I think the real issue with the pacing is that this time around, they're following more characters and they're in more locations, so the film has to move everyone's story along at an even pace, so some parts just aren't as interesting as others. But it still needs to be there to show a character's journey to a location, so that we know how they got there, and because they're going to be needed later on for something more important. And you really feel this the most with Elizabeth in the first half of the movie. So some parts just aren't as interesting, which lead to things feeling like a drag at times. But the bigger issue is that since this is only half of the story, a lot of things just feel like set up for the third film. There are some good moments for sure, but it doesn't have that triumphant ending or conclusion, because this movie sets up several things that will be resolved in the next film. Like how will they get Jack back from the Kraken? Can Will save his father from Davy Jones? How are they going to defeat Davy Jones? Now that Beckett has Davy Jones' heart, what's he going to do with it? What's at World's End and how do you get there? There's just a lot 
lot of setup here and no real payoff. It's almost like two towers in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Nothing is quite resolved yet and the story has to keep going, so only a few things are wrapped up and the rest has to carry over. Although don't get me wrong, Two Towers is a far superior movie of course. I'm just saying when you watch them back to back that's kind of what it feels like. It's in a strange section of the story where it has to keep going and keep carrying over plot points, while also introducing a few more that won't get resolved until the next entry. It kind of feels like that in a way. And this is why I think this one has the least amount of rewatch value. Yeah, it's pretty fun and very well made without a doubt, but once you see it for the first time, you don't really need to see it again. You just have to remember a few plot points and then skip to the third film. The first works well as a self-contained story, but it's not the case with the two follow-up sequels. You have Dead Man's Chest that is mostly there to set up and introduce everything for the third film, where you will finally have the epic conclusion. It's not like the first one where they leave it open for a sequel, you know where like the story is done and told, but you can continue it. No, in this case it really is like they chopped the story in half, so it leaves you mostly unsatisfied, and I guess it isn't fair to hold it against the movie, but it's hard to shake that feeling when you watch it. You see when I first saw it, I was hyped as hell, and was anxious to see the next, but now that I can access all of them fairly easily, I find myself revisiting this one less and less. I guess this was bound to happen because they split the story in two, but for what it is, it's a pretty decent continuation of the story that is a lot of fun, but it just sets up a lot for the next film so that kind of hurts the rewatch value, at least to me personally. And I still mostly enjoyed it, even though it did drag in a few spots. It's definitely more ambitious and expands the world and lore and feels much bigger, but it's one I've always found myself rewatching less and less often out of the original trilogy, because a lot of it is here to set up stuff for the sequel. I wish I had more I could say, but all I can muster is, yeah, it's an okay movie. I don't hate it at all, and it's definitely well made, and visually it still looks great to this day, but it's definitely not my favorite out of all the Pirates movies, and it's not one I come back to often. So it's a fine movie and a decent sequel, although the next film was definitely something special. Picking up not long after Dead Man's Chest, At World's End tells the rest of the story that was set up in the previous movie. Jack is in Davy Jones' locker, and the crew must find a way to bring him back. All the while, Beckett is using Davy Jones to take out pirates on the seas to further gain control on the waters, thanks to the fact that he has Davy Jones' heart, which then causes the nine pirate lords to be summoned so they can discuss what to do about it, to see if there's a way to stop Beckett and Davy Jones before they all get wiped out. And on top of all that, Will wants to find a way to free his father from his servitude on the Flying Dutchman. So this movie wraps up basically everything that was brought up in the second film, as well as concluding the overall trilogy. This was the last appearance from Will and Elizabeth in the series, and it kind of gives their story a bittersweet end. Well, it was at the time before they decided to undo that, but we'll get there. But of course, the ending is still left open for a sequel following Jack Sparrow. Now, this is one of the most expensive movies ever made at the time, and it held that title for years. Hell, I still think it's in like the top 10. With its budget of $300 million, that's more than it cost to make all three of the Lord of the Ring films. And that's even after adjusting for inflation. Nowadays, we're kind of used to hearing about studios spending hundreds of millions of dollars on movies, but still, $300 million is a lot and even more crazy by 2007 standards. And it's one of those movies where you can look at it and tell, yeah, this shit is expensive. The CGI is top tier here and still looks pretty damn great. From the monstrous crew members, to Davy Jones, to the ships, and hell, even the water. You know how hard it is to make CGI water look good? Not to mention the countless sets, locations, and just the size of them, and the sheer amount of actors and extras on screen. The movie feels huge and big, and as an ending of the trilogy, it feels epic at times. If it isn't obvious, I really like this one. It adds even more bizarre fantasy elements, with them literally falling off the face of the earth and even unleashing an imprisoned god, as well as going to Davy Jones's locker. Some of it is a bit ridiculous, but I found it all to be very interesting. Like, they have a damn court of pirate lords, and basically all the action scenes in general are hectic as hell. The movie is pretty insane at times, but I found it to be very fun. The pacing is also a bit better than the second, but it is a 2 hour and 40 minute long movie, so there still are a few spots that aren't as well paced as others. But the whole last hour is great for sure, and makes up for the slower or rush bits in the middle. And this time around, there are things that are happening that I find more interesting in general, and there's an actual payoff in this film, so you don't have like two hours of setup. Something I want to mention now that applies to both Dead Man's Chest and World's End is that I kind of like how much scheming and plotting happens between characters. They are constantly screwing each other over, cutting deals and changing their alliances in so many situations, all to help them complete their end goals. It honestly gets pretty convoluted at times, with characters cutting deals in secret away from other characters, but then they have their own secret plan hidden from the audience as well, and their plan changes on the fly depending on the situation. It happens a lot in these movies, but it's at an all-time high in the third film. It gets pretty ridiculous, but I don't mind it too much. At least most of their end goals remain consistent. They just keep changing up how they get to it. Still pretty ridiculous how much they fuck each other over. They're like the worst group of siblings with how much they flip flop. I also want to mention that Dead Man's Chest and World's End are much darker than the first film. It's not as goofy and there's a little less slapstick, although it's still kind of there in the action scenes, but there are some dark scenes and implications. Like the third one opens with a mass execution. Beckett orders everyone suspected of piracy, or even helping a pirate to be hanged. Though I do know that this shift in tone is 
is one reason for some people not caring for these two. They just prefer the more upbeat tone from the first film. I personally don't mind it at all though. It's a pretty interesting shift but not so drastic that it completely changes the franchise. I just wanted to mention now because later we're going to see what happens when things get too goofy. Oh and this movie has one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. It's when the Black Pearl and Flying Dutchman unleash hell on Beckett's ship. Ants is getting shredded to pieces. And you have Beckett in disbelief and just walking slowly down his ship as the realization that he actually lost hits him. It's truly a great scene. Now for as much as I like this movie, there are a few downsides of course, and it's really just a few parts I thought were a bit underwhelming. For starters, Davy Jones' locker was a bit disappointing. It was cool how they got there by literally falling off the edge of the world, but Jack isn't there long before they escape. Within the first hour, they got Jack back and are working on getting to the meeting with the other pirate lords. Just really wish this concept of Davy Jones' locker was explored a bit more. Also, the goddess Calypso wasn't as important as I thought she was going to be. They make a big deal about releasing her, but all she does is cause a big storm and the ocean to spin. I mean, it looked cool, but besides adding more to Davy Jones' backstory, which I did like, she really didn't have a bigger purpose. Besides the fact that Barbosa and her had a deal that he would release her for bringing him back to life, but she wasn't as crucial to the finale or the whole overall story as I thought she was going to be, which is pretty surprising considering, you know, she's a god. And the last thing I'll mention is something very, very small, and it's that the Kraken was killed off screen by David Jones himself because he was forced to by Beckett. I really liked the Kraken in the last movie and was hoping that they would get more creative with it in this film, but nope, you just see it's dead carcass. So that was a bit disappointing. Overall, I definitely prefer At World's End over Dead Man's Chest because I found it to be a much more epic, fun, and crazy adventure. I really liked all the more fantastical and magic elements, and I actually do like the bittersweet ending with Elizabeth and Will's story. Oh, did I mention that this movie was beautiful? Well, it is. It hands down has some of the best cinematography in the whole series. And of course, the sets and CGI are just top tier, which isn't a surprise at this point. Just a fantastic looking movie all around. I really enjoyed this one, and out of the original trilogy, this is my second favorite. And I found it to be a pretty badass ending. Now it seems like I really didn't go into much detail when talking about the first three, and there's a reason for that. These ones are considered by most fans to be the best ones in the franchise, and if you're watching this video, I kind of assume you already know about them and why they're good, because you know, you probably saw them. So I didn't want to spend too much time explaining why they're great, because I really want to get into the fourth and fifth ones so I can really start drawing into them and explaining why they don't work, and that way we can compare them to the original trilogy and see what's different about them. So my overall thoughts on the first three are that I think they're all really good, although I do know that there are some fans who didn't really like the second and third one found them to be pretty disappointing, and I actually completely understand that. They definitely aren't as well as put together as the first film, but I do think they're really solid continuations. But after this trilogy concluded, the franchise went on a brief hiatus, and then in 2011, Pirates of the Caribbean hit the big screens again with the fourth installment on Stranger Tides. Now, for the fourth installment, there was a slight change in of the guard. The director of the first three didn't return, although the writers did, and the story was actually loosely based on a book by Tim Powers called On Stranger Tides. Now, the goal of this movie was to do something similar to the first, a solo, standalone adventure that would just be told in one movie. Disney wasn't sure about doing another trilogy just yet, so they wanted to test the waters with a new movie to see if audiences still vied with it after a four-year break, with the plan being that, if it was successful, then they would greenlight the fifth and sixth entries, although they invested heavily into it, with a budget of 400 and 10 million dollars, making it the most expensive movie ever. Although it is worth noting that the increase in the budget was because they were shooting the film in 3D. This was part of the rejuvenated 3D craze that hit the late 2000s and early 2010s, and they were looking to cash in on that. But shooting in 3D is much more expensive than transferring to 3D, like many other movies were doing at the time, because it required much more advanced and newer technology and cameras to do so. Hence why this movie and Avatar cost so damn much. And also, I'm pretty certain that it was expensive to get Giant Depp back. Apparently, he was paid 55 million dollars for his role in this movie. So this time around, the eventual will be solely focused on Jack Sparrow, since Elizabeth and Will's story was done. Oh, I'll get to you. And following the wacky adventures of Jack Sparrow wasn't a bad idea. He was a fan favorite character, so why not? And thus, production began and was released in 2011, and the film did great at the box office, bringing in over a billion dollars. However, the reception from fans and critics was less than stellar. Let's take a look and see why that is. I don't find you funny. So we follow Jack Sparrow, as he is taken captive by an ex-lover named Angelica and her father, Blackbeard. They are looking for the Fountain of Youth, and they're forcing Jack to show them the way. All the while, the English are looking for it as well, with Barbosa leading the search. And so are the Spanish. So, the chase is on to see who can get the proper items, and to the Fountain of Youth first. Now this entry is what kids call nowadays, mid. If this was a Call of Duty game, it would be something like COD World War II or Cold War. Just an okay, average experience. And that's me being generous, because I like this franchise. Let me explain 
what I mean. So you have a decent setup and the elements are there to make up a good pirates movie. You have some sort of magical item as the MacGuffin that everyone is looking for, this time being the Fountain of Youth. You have a legend like Blackbeard as one of the antagonists. You have magic and other fantastical things like mermaids, voodoo, zombification, and hell, Blackbeard has a sword that lets him control ships. That's pretty cool. At the heart of it all, you got Jack Sparrow and his wild shenanigans. Now we all knew it was going to be a step down from the two previous films. It wasn't going to be as big, giant, or epic. It was going to tell a much more straightforward and simpler story like the first. But what happened was it slid into mediocrity, like it was just going through the motions. It felt mostly safe and didn't really try to do anything crazy. The action set pieces aren't that creative outside of like one. Most of the new characters aren't that memorable. And the writing is a step down in terms of the witty dialogue, which is surprising because it had the same writers from the previous three. I guess he just got burnt out. Really, the whole movie is just carried by Johnny Depp. And the whole thing just feels like a mostly forgettable experience. There's also a few things in the movie that feel pretty useless, like the romance between the religious guy and the mermaid. It was just forgettable because they aren't interesting characters. And at one point, I actually forgot that the Spanish are in this movie and they're also looking for the Fountain of Youth. Honestly, you could just kind of cut them out and just barely have to change anything. I mean, they end up destroying the Fountain of Youth, but that could have easily been the pirates or the English when they're fighting each other. I know it sounds like I'm being negative, and that's because I am. There are only a few things that I would consider pretty good. The first 20 minutes or so wasn't that bad. Jack pretended to be a judge and the escaping custody was pretty fun. So the first act that sets everything up was entertaining. Just once he gets on this ship, things become less interesting. All the established characters were fine. Jack, Barbosa, Mr. Gibbs. They all work pretty well. And I also didn't mind Blackbeard. I thought he was a decent villain. Oh, and the music was okay, I guess. Yeah, that's really about it. You got a few funny lines and scenes here and there. And there's some decent action set pieces, but there's nothing amazing that really stands out. It feels like a mostly safe experience. And again, the pieces are there to have a fun pirate adventure, but they didn't utilize them. Honestly, it feels like a watered down version of the previous films. Almost like an imitation. It's really weird. It just really lacks that quality touch. And I don't know if it's just me, but this doesn't look as good as the previous two films, which predated by four and five years respectively. Of course, the cinematography and camera work isn't as impressive. In fact, outside of a handful of scenes, it's mostly stale. But even the CGI isn't as good either. I mean, it doesn't look bad, but it's not as polished as before. Same with some of the sets and locations. Some just don't look as good as before. It's hard to describe. Maybe I'm just being nitpicky. But all in all, this wasn't a giant triumphant return to the world of Pirates of the Caribbean. Instead, it was more so just a below average adventure that had a few bright spots, but wasn't memorable at all. It felt like a downgrade in terms of the action, the writing, the story, and the acting. It felt very much like it was just going through the motions and doing what a Pirates of the Caribbean film is supposed to do, without really trying to excel in any aspect of it. So without a doubt, it was just a big downgrade. It really feels more like an imitation of the previous films instead of a continuation. It gets all the right pieces and elements that the previous films had, but then does fuck all with it, culminating in just a very forgettable experience. So despite the financial success, the fifth entry wasn't greenlit right away, due to the reception. So they decided not to go ahead with a new film. Although Stranger Tides proved that there was definitely still interest in the franchise, so the idea for a new one stayed at the forefront of Disney's mind until 2017, when they released the latest film, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Taking place roughly 19 years after the events of the third film, we follow the son of Will and Elizabeth, Henry, as he seeks out Jack Sparrow to help him find Poseidon's trident, so he can use it to break the curse that's placed on his father so he can leave the Flying Dutchman. Meanwhile, a vengeful cursed spirit from the past named Salazar is pursuing Jack to get his revenge for defeating and killing him in battle several decades ago. And also, Barbosa is there, and so, the race is on to get to the trident. So where to begin with this? So here's how I see it. If On Stranger Tides dug the grave for the series, then Dead Men Tell No Tales kicked it in and threw dirt on it. Whereas Stranger Tides felt like an imitation, this one feels almost like a parody at times, mainly with how it handles Jack Sparrow. You see, here, Jack is no longer the eccentric, weird, kinda goofy pirate. Instead, he's a bumbling drunk who's so stupid that he forgets that he's in the middle of a heist and passes out. It feels like a parody or a spoof, but no, it's an official Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I get that the goal was to make Jack down on his luck, but they didn't have to make him this dumb in the process. One of the main things that made Jack so much fun before was his intelligence. Yes, he was strange. Yes, he was goofy. Yes, he was funny. But he was was also very clever and always planning and scheming. It was to the point where you couldn't really tell if he was putting on an act to fool the person he was talking to. He always kept you guessing, but the writers here just made him really stupid. So it's probably the fault of the writers for taking this direction with Jack and turn him into a goofy, dumb parody of himself. But it's also worth mentioning that Johnny Depp himself, around this time, wasn't in good shape. This was around the time he was having several personal issues that involved drug and alcohol abuse, and we watch behind the scenes clips, bloopers, and gag reels. He seems just checked out. I'm a little bit late. I'm so drunk. <laughs> you know what I mean. 
it's an old saying. <laughs> his stuttering and slurring speech, both on and off camera, is kind of a clear indication that he just wasn't all there. Hell, sometimes there are scenes in the movie where it's hard to make out what he's saying. If he was just going through the motions in the fourth film, here he's just completely checked out. Honestly, it was just kind of sad to watch. It's just a clear drop in the performance here. And this movie does something kind of stupid. So they tied the new villain Salazar into Jack's backstory, which is fine. They've done it in every other Pirates movie before, so that's okay. But they decided to show the conflict that fuels Salazar's hatred for Jack, and seeing the young CGI face Johnny Depp just looks so weird. But they take it a step further, and in the same scene, they show how Jack got his clothes, his hat, and other personal effects. Just some unnecessary stuff. What does this really add? In the previous films, we didn't need to see a younger version of Jack making a deal with Davy Jones. You could just have the dialogue and interactions between characters explain this stuff. But what's even more annoying about this flashback is that they actually change how Jack came across the compass. In Dead Man's Chest, it's revealed that he took it from the voodoo lady. He either stole it or he made a deal for it. But here, they change it to him receiving it from his captain as he was dying. And they added a new condition to it, that once you have it, you can never abandon it for some reason. This was never a thing before, because the compass used to bounce around to just about everybody in the main cast in the previous films. But they changed it here so there could be a reason for Salazar being able to escape. So it's all really just kind of dumb. But yeah, so Jack just kind of sucks here. And these new additions to his backstory just doesn't really add anything, and even contradicts previous films. But let's talk about some other characters, shall we? The returning ones like Barbosa and Gibbs were just kind of there, not really standing out or stealing the show. They're just kind of going along with it. But that's still more than I can say for the new characters. Henry and Karina are fucking lame. Henry is a bore, and Karina is kind of an annoying know-it-all. Sadly, it's not like you can ignore them, because they are some of the main protagonists, and the story revolves around them. And they're also the romantic leads. But they're not interesting or entertaining characters, so I really don't care about them. Now, Salazar as the villain isn't the worst idea. A guy wronged by Jack in the past and wants revenge. A bit simple and cliche, sure, but it could work if the character is entertaining. But Salazar just isn't. Him and his crew's design are pretty interesting, I guess. But I really didn't care for him as a villain. He just came across as a bit dull. But something else is a new addition to something from the previous films is that they decided to add to the conclusion of the third film by finding a way to give Will and Elizabeth a happy ending. But maybe it was really just a way to get them back in a movie so that fans can be excited to see them again, even if it's only for like one or two scenes. Like I mentioned earlier, Henry is looking for the train so he can break the curse that's on Will. Then blah blah blah, things happen, then the curse is broken. Then Will and Elizabeth have a happy ending. Yeah, I really didn't care for this like at all. I preferred the ending from the third film. I feel like it didn't need to be continued. Yeah, it was bittersweet, but I liked it. Here, they're changing it, and Will and Elizabeth aren't even involved in it, like at all. We spent three films with them, building this story, and after it's done, they just throw together a new ending because the writers are out of ideas, and have no idea where to take the story. That's really what it feels like. They're out of ideas, so they're just taking things people recognize, and know from the previous films, and just changing and adding to it. Yo, this is a lot like the modern Star Wars. It's clear that the creativity and spark is just gone. And the whole movie has like an overly goofy tone to it. It's almost like they went in the complete opposite direction of Dead Man's Chest and At World's End. Like we already discussed, Jack is just an annoying drunk for the whole movie, but there are also several attempts at humor, but the writing just isn't as witty or clever as the first three. So a lot of jokes just fall flat. I think it's funny that this movie and on Stranger Ties both have end credit scenes that are definitely never going to be followed up on. Okay, I will give it some credit. They tried to bring back the big creative set pieces, like in the beginning with the save getting dragged through town, or when they save Jack from being executed. These aren't that bad, and they definitely tried to make something fun and unique, but outside of that, nothing else is that entertaining. Surprisingly, even though this is the shortest film in the series, I think this one drags the most, because you're following uninteresting characters in a story you don't care about that almost feels like it's mocking what came before. By the halfway point, I just couldn't wait for it to end. Oh, I want to mention that the movie is also known as Salazar's Revenge in some parts of the world. In the box set that I own, that's the name that's on the cover. I don't really have much to add, I just didn't know where else to mention this in the video. Did I mention I don't like this movie? So despite its quality, the movie did surprisingly well, bringing in over 790 million at the box office. Again, proving that people are genuinely interested in this series. Now, even though this was marketed as the final adventure, there was a potential sequel in the work starring Margot Robbie as the lead, and it would be some sort of like sequel slash reboot thing, similar to The Force Awakens, I presume. But this was recently announced to be canceled, and like I said in the beginning of this video, I think was a good call because if the latest film buried it, then the sixth one would be just dancing on the grave. So let's go ahead and get to the last part so we can wrap this video up. What the fuck is this piece of shit? So after rewatching all the movies, I'll summarize basically what happened to this franchise. The first one exploded onto the scene in 2003 and gained popularity and attention that no one could have anticipated. But it laid a good foundation to build a sequel on, and so that's what they did, releasing two more that basically pushed things to the limits, increasing the size and scope of the story and action, as well as taking advantage of CGI and motion capture technology, creating some of the biggest and most expensive movies in history. And then after this, they were pretty much spent on ideas and fell into mediocrity and not exploring any new concepts or ways to keep the series fresh. And it seemed like 
think they stopped pushing themselves. But the series was popular so they had to put something out. And that's what gave us the fourth film. A very lukewarm, watered down entry. Showcasing that they were basically running on fumes at this point. And then finally when the last one rolled around, they were out of ideas and started falling back on their previous films to try to draw from their past successes to make something new. But the creativity and inspiration was completely gone. And completely lost the wit and charm that made it popular in the first place. It took its own characters and world and basically turned it into a joke. And that's what it feels like when you watch these films. It just took a nosedive in quality after the first three. This franchise was fun. Clearly you can tell that I liked three out of five of them. But maybe it really was just lightning in a bottle that couldn't be replicated. I mean the first three were so successful that Disney tried to make new blockbusters by investing in some other IPs like John Carter and The Lone Ranger. Trying to recreate the success of the pirate films. But clearly none of those panned out. But they kind of stopped doing that once the MCU took off and they acquired Star Wars. The Pirates franchise was fun while it lasted but it ran out of steam and creative juices. And even though Dead Men Tell No Tales wasn't the best send off, I'm still okay with the series not coming back because arguably there really hasn't been one as well made and put together as the first film. So I'm okay with them letting it rest. I have fond memories so it sucks to see it end like this but I think it's best to leave it lie instead of trying to resurrect it. But considering how well these movies do, I wouldn't be surprised if they somehow squeeze out a sixth one. Or imagine if they rebooted it within the next five years. That would be wild. But I think it's about time to end this video so I want to ask you guys what do you think about the Pirates of the Caribbean films? Which one's your favorite? Leave a comment and let me know. And of course if you enjoyed the video go and drop a like on it. And I'll give a nice big shout out to the channel members. If you're interested in becoming a channel member click the join button down below check out the perks. If they interest you consider joining or not it don't matter. None of this matters. Also, I'm drinking like monster energy drinks sometimes, which are like piss magnets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're delicious, but they make you want to pee. Make you want to beat your wife, too, dude. I've seen.